Well, welcome to Talk Back, everybody. Um, this is a casual experience, even though we're in the sanctuary, so feel free to walk around. And it is raining outside, so you might want to stay anyway, because it's raining. But we are grateful to have week two with our friend, Reverend Dr. Bill Leonard. Um, if you have questions, just drop them in the basket up here, or I will come around with the mic at the end for comments and additional questions. So Dr. Leonard, I have a question from one of our, uh, one of our people here today. Uh, she said she heard you on a podcast this week and you were talking about the Southern Baptist Convention and she wanted to know if the new person who has been elected, do you think that there is a uh, hope forward momentum for that convention, for the new minister that was elected? No, next question. <laughs> I'm kidding you. I'm, I'm kidding you all. Um, I, I was on Al Hunt and James Carville's program and um, uh, we moved really quickly, and, but I've been on three uh, different, in different settings in the last two weeks. Uh, I'll do a quick thing with you that um, gets at the Southern Baptist Convention is, is important in, in that it is a case study in what is happening in American religion uh, across the board and um, across the theological spectrum. Uh, it, it is the largest, but its membership and baptisms are dropping like a stone and have been since the late 1990s. But, but most obviously in the 2000s. Uh, it, is, it is a fundamentalist-led uh, denomination, and you'll just have to Google that. <laughs> but, um, uh, and it is a, it is a uh, communion, and this is, this is me now. I, I, I was a Southern Baptist, grew up a Southern Baptist, left the SBC in 92 when... Um, Sanford University sent the helicopter to the roof of the embassy to get me out of Louisville. And um, uh, the, um, uh, so, but, but then I, we, we joined the great Sixth Avenue Baptist in uh, Birmingham, which is National Baptist, and now an ABC church, I think I may have mentioned, uh, in Winston-Salem. And, uh, but I've been studying them for some time because they are a case study. And here's two, two or three things that happened. One, uh, they promised that if uh, they would get rid of the liberals, quote unquote, uh, they would not go the way of the main lines, uh, meaning uh, the Presbyterians, the Methodists, the Episcopal Church, the Lutherans, uh, and decline. And uh, they have. And they promised that if, if the church, if, if the denomination as a whole would subscribe to a particular way of interpreting the Bible based on their version of biblical inerrancy, uh, the, the growth would continue. And instead, what has happened is they have in many, and, and they, I mean leadership here, I'm not talking about individual Southern Baptists necessarily, they have... Um, uh, they have replaced a warm heart with what Ralph Waldo Emerson called of both Unitarians and, uh, uh, Purit uh, and uh, Presbyterians uh, in the 19th century New England. They've replaced heart religion with corpse-cold creedalism. That's Emerson's word. <clears throat> Meaning uh, they, they run to Jesus and, and have made religious experience transactional. Pray a prayer and you're in. Now sign the confession of faith and you're orthodox. And I'm, I'm generalizing, but not much. Uh, so that's one thing they have done. The second thing they have done is they have, um, they have created a base. They have so divided and so run off uh, <clears throat> so many people, not just folks like me, but a variety of people, that they now have a very limited base. 85% are uh, white, 8% are African American, about three or 4% are Latino. And they know they need, Af they know they need Baptists of color to, 
to continue to exist, really. But their method of interpreting scripture, biblical inerrancy, and here's where I'll wind up, but it's a lesson for all of us and it relates to the sermon and to today. Uh, their method of interpreting scripture, which began in 1845 when Baptists, white Baptists in the South took the scripture and utilized it uh, to support chattel slavery. Richard Furman, 1822, had the holding of slaves been a moral evil, we cannot suppose that the holy apostles who feared not the faces of men would have tolerated it for a moment in the Christian church. That document, written in response to the Denmark V.C. Uh, supposed uh, rebellion, uh, is the beginning, really, of the formal biblical defenses of slavery in the South. And that hermeneutic is so still so much a part, that method of interpreting the Bible, is still so much a part of Southern Baptist use of Scripture that so they do push-pull with African Americans. We want you, we're all one in Christ, but by the way, uh, uh, you want us to, to uh, say things about race and racism that we can't say, so uh, hold on. And the doctrine of complementarity which is using some of the same Pauline texts as slavery to talk about the, the role of women and the relationship of men and women in the church and in the family. It's the same hermeneutic. Don't let anybody tell you it isn't. It's the same method of interpreting scripture. Uh, and, and that's what's uh, cutting the heart out of their religious experience. Uh, <laughs> I was thinking one of you might yell, don't hold back, Leonard. Um, and, and, but they are a case study, and, and, and you all don't want me to get into this, but I'm just going to say it and leave it. They're the Republican Party at prayer. Be, no, I will say this. Because Protestantism, I've told you all this multiple summers, Protestantism, Protestant privilege in the country is gone. And, and Southern Baptists have had so much cultural privilege since 1845 and really earlier uh, that they don't know what to do about the loss of cultural privilege. So, and it just happens to be the Republicans, but they're running to the government uh, to try to get them to uh, set about policies that um, uh, at least gird up their culture privilege. And they're doing that in the name of religious liberty. Uh, and I know some of those folks, some of them who said, W.A. Criswell at First Baptist Church Dallas said years ago, uh, separation of church and state is an infidel idea. Now the folks at First Baptist Dallas act like they invented religious freedom for, for the reasons that you can Google and find out. So that's my... <laughs> Thank you for that answer. I did roll my eyes a little bit at the complimentarian. Yes, I hope you. Yes, we all should. Uh, um, so we have a question that's related. Um, somebody asked, did Jesus also imply the acceptance of slavery along with Paul? No. I didn't think so. And that settles it. Paul accepts slavery as a social given. And, and I'm going to say this, I don't think I've ever said this out loud. I, yeah, I have too, I, in class, but I don't think I've ever said it in a church. Uh, unfortunately, he wrote that into a couple of his letters. Uh, he accepts slavery, a particular kind of Roman-related slavery, but he writes it in, into Scripture in a way that opened the door for it being applied to chattel slavery. Both are slavery. I've had people tell me, now the Romans, it wasn't really, no, it was slavery. But chattel slavery, the way the Southerners defended it using the Pauline passages uh, was, was much, much more detrimental and violent and cruel and all of that. Uh, and, and, but Paul, Paul sees that slavery and, and, and he, he, he does push-pull too. In another passage he says, in Christ there's neither Jew nor Greek, slave or free, male or female. And he gets to Jew and Greek, but he doesn't get to slave and free or male and female. 
He keeps the first century practices. And, and from 1619 to 1863, 65, and even beyond, uh, African Americans are paying for the misuse uh, or, or, or the overuse, whatever you want to say, of the Pauline passages. Hmm. Hmm. And we don't accept slavery as a social given, by the way. You all know that. Uh, we don't. And that's where, that's where we and St. Paul part company on the text. Mm -hmm. Yes. Related, how does the pandemic impact the church in light of today's scripture? Invite me back next summer <laughs> and we'll talk about it. We don't know quite yet. Here's what we know. Um, people are disengaging from religion. I'll give you an example. Christianity Today study reported 50% uh, of uh, young people in the millennial category who grew up Southern Baptist have left, 50%. That's, that's been documented. So this, this disengagement was going on and impacting churches uh, right and left uh, across the spectrum. What we don't know is whether or not, uh, or no, we don't know how uh, a year and a half plus are, will, will impact. Uh, and I hear from multiple pastors, you probably do too, Mia, or church folks, saying there's a whole group of people, uh, and this is funny, but it's not, who discovered we enjoy sitting home and watching church much more uh, diligently than we did having to dress our kids, dress ourselves, drag ourselves out and get there. And that's the thing that is going to be, the, the, is, is sending ripples and and fisher all around um, churches, again, across the spectrum. And, and that's, that's what we don't know what that impact will be. But uh, here's, a, here's a little bit of hope. Similar things happened in, around the turn of the 19th century, early 1800s, when the nation started going west. And churches up east thought, that if they didn't start going west and change the way they were, the, the west was going to be, and west meant Indiana and Illinois, by the way, in 1800, uh, would go, this was their word, would turn to barbarism. That was the 19th century word, barbarism. And so we're just coming off. I'm at the end of a generation of folks who grew up in churches in the South that were highly impacted by that 19th century revivalistic uh, uh, gospel song singing, uh, hellfire and damnation preaching uh, agenda. 11 o'clock, you got the chores done, uh, you got in the wagon, took the kids to church. 11 o'clock was a rural church hour. I still know people who think they can't worship God unless it's at 11 o'clock on Sunday. And they live in condos in New York City. So um, the churches changed dramatically in the 19th century as the culture changed. And we've had a little bit of that. The emerging church people uh, that I don't hear much from now, but they, they really saw this and offered some options. Uh, Brian McLaren and Phyllis Tickle and folks like that. But, but we've got to find ways uh, to, to re-engage the culture. Uh, and we have to do that by going into the culture because the, the old thing of, I said this last week, I think when you move into a city, the, the third Sunday you move your membership to a church. Nah, not there. So, so the energy for that has got to be uh, picking up. And I think the spirituality movement, which doesn't rule out Christianity, it's just this, uh, uh, the, the idea that uh, I'm spiritual but not religious, believers not belongers. I think that's an entry point for talking about uh, the, the, the spirituality, not the doctrinal dogmatic rigidity and I think you all are making a good run at that yourselves. 
as a follow-up, do you think people are afraid of belonging? So it's not so much they don't like it, but they're afraid of being attached to something that might go sour <laughs> at some point. That's a, Mia, that's a really important insight to bring to bear today to that. I think so. I think, I think there's a suspicion of institutions that has worked its way into the system. Uh, and we all know the list. And uh, I think... Um, and also, I think the fights, the public fights that the church has had uh, left, left to a certain extent, right particularly in the last few years, also pushes people away. I don't want to be with that kind of community. And I'll, and I'll give you an illustration. Uh, and this is, this is absolutely just me. So you just get up this morning, New York Times, or yesterday morning, Roman Catholic bishops want to set a new Eucharistic confession of faith that rules out politicians who don't tie, tie, uh, tie the line. Uh, let's, just, let's, let's just say this. If Catholics are going to do that, the bishops are to start the documents by saying, this is just me now, uh, before you read this document, we are saying that we have made a mess out of our conversations about sex. Uh, we have, we have uh, sexually abusing priests that we protected as bishops. We are publicly repenting of that. And if you, can't, if, you, if you think we haven't repented enough, don't read any more of this document because we have no right to speak to you. And, 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 and we Baptists should say, we're not going to talk about critical, Southern Baptists should say, and the rest of us should join, we're not going to criticize cri critical race theory because we've been doing this kind of thing since 1845. So we're not going to talk about race in a way that isn't beneficial to people uh, until, we, until we repent. And we have to do that publicly. And the more we keep doing these push-pull racial things, the more we go back to 1845 where we didn't belong in the first place. So that Roman Catholics are talking about uh, doing this. Let's just, have, let's just have another statement of faith that runs more people off before they ever get a chance to hear the Jesus story. Or, or where the Jesus story is so minimized in our congregations that they don't even, have, they don't even hear it or have time to get to it because of what we're laying on them in the culture war. You all got me started this morning. I'm sorry. I know I'm not sorry. You asked for it. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, so I have a question uh, from a person in the congregation. She says, how should I, a white woman, celebrate this Juneteenth holiday as I am exposed as the inheritor of the traits and actions of my ancestor, slave owners, and perpetuators of the injustices of Jim Crow, uh, segregation, I'm missing some words here. How do I mourn, I think this is, how do I mourn my potential? Um, so I think this person is asking, how do they celebrate freedom, particularly yeah. Juneteenth, as yeah. a white woman with the history? Yeah, by doing just that, by celebrating. By celebrating with the people who have the right to celebrate it, but also to say, uh, I, I, I came from a tradition, I came from a family, I'm saying this, uh, not answering for somebody else, uh, that perpetuated something that the, the, the residuals of which are still with us. But I'm going to join in these public and private and, and communal and congregational, in this case, and, and interpersonal connections as best I can where I am, and I'm going to be intentional about that. I'm not going to wait for that to happen. I'm going to be intentional. And, and, and that kind of intentionality is both a form of entry into a new creation and also a repentance for an old creation. And, and I, I've been reading, I wrote an article about this a uh, little bit. Um, uh, I've been reading some of these states that are saying, uh, please don't tell about the Tulsa massacre. Please don't tell about why uh, 
Juneteenth is important in the Texas public schools because it will, and don't, don't bring up any subjects in class that will uh, cause, and there's a list they run in, in these states, uh, psychological distress, uh, uh, fear, etc. Well, then don't teach history. Don't teach history. Just close the door on the history classes. If the, if the classes you're going to teach are going to perpetuate something other than what we didn't get told. I, never, I grew up in Texas and knew about Juneteenth because we knew some black people. Not many, but we knew some black people. But I never heard about it in Texas history class, which you had to take. And, and so there, there, there's, there's a repenting element, but it must be coupled with the intentionality of, of something else. And I, I keep saying this, and I, I didn't say it in the sermon this morning, but I, I meant to. It amazes me that people say, we can't repent for our uh, relatives in slavery time. Okay, don't repent. Then don't tell me that I have to repent for Adam and Eve. Mm. We've been telling people Adam and Eve made us all sinners since, since at least John Calvin. No, since at least Augustine, who took St. Paul and made it more. So don't, don't talk about Adam and Eve anymore if you're not going to talk about, about the way in which our previous generations shaped us knowingly and unknowingly. And that's what... And that's why I say it's all unoriginal sin. Show me one good original sin and I will uh, write a book about it. But there ain't any more. But, but that kind of intentionality about both. I want to talk a little bit about repentance and mourning. Um, I was really moved by the naming of the, the, the people and the enslaved people in your sermon mm. and how important it is to name Yes. To name, yes. to actually say it out loud. And so I'm reading a comment from somebody who says, only yesterday I read in a family history the names of four slaves who were given to my great-grandmother as a bride. And then they say, actually, I couldn't read them. What are your thoughts about the purpose of naming and saying out loud and mourning and weeping, particularly... Um, as people who consider themselves on a journey of faith. We have to do it. Whether that becomes, as in this case, uh, familially personal, my great-grandmother or whatever, et cetera. Though th that, that's, that's a necessity. But also finding ways to speak names either in our hearts when we read these materials or in public forums where we can. Uh, and, and as I, I said, I, I'd been reading this historical material just about Washington Manley Wingate. And, and I, I've talked a lot about Furman because his, uh, his address, Exposition 1822, is so direct and so thorough in the way it lays this out. But literally, I started typing those names. And, and the reason they were powerful to me, again, in a Baptist church still in existence, and I'm not blaming the current Wake Forest Baptist Church in Wake Forest, North Carolina, but it's still in existence. It's their church role. Uh, there were these people who couldn't even be named by the one name they'd been given. They had to be named by the person who owned them. And that's in a Baptist church. I couldn't get any closer than that, personally. Uh, particularly with, with the folks I study. And, and I had been reading and I'd been reading it. And, and I just, I wasn't even thinking about weeping. I just typed. And <sighs> I just couldn't stop. And uh, I went in to tell Candace, my spouse, and I couldn't quit. And that's, that's for me, that's the power of those names. Those were living people named Jenny and Isaac and Charlotte. Uh, 
and I, I needed to say them without any reference to who they belonged to. And finding ways to do that uh, personally and communally. And, and I thought today, this, this was an exercise for me. I have to speak them separate from the way I typed them. And it's, it's entirely possible that somebody will crawl up there uh, years and years from now and, and start unpacking us in the congregation. And that, that helps me repent. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it, it's, it, it helps me think about where I am, that I'm not better than those people. I'm different, and I have to stay different from them. I can't get pulled back into that in some way that's so subtle uh, that I think it, it's okay. Whew, thank you for that. Let me just say again what I didn't say at the benediction. I can't tell the, the staff of this church how much it means to me that just uh, providentially uh, you all invited me to come and preach these two Sundays. Um, and, and I didn't even think about when Ben uh, called months ago about this, I didn't even think about this as, our, as my 50th anniversary. Uh, I got in, ordained in Mesquite, Texas, uh, Northridge Baptist Church. You can't get there from here. And, and uh, I got ordained. I finished seminary, and I, I, was, a, I was kind of uh, unique in, among my peers because in those days in Texas, white male boys got ordained early. So, so I was 25, and, and that was late in, among my peers. And Candace Leonard and I got in my yellow 1968 Mustang, the greatest car God ever let me drive with a U-Haul, and we drove to Boston uh, where she taught junior high, and I um, uh, worked on the doctorate. And then, I'll just be quick with this, then with no more sense, for some reason, I went to the BU School of Theology office and said, is anybody looking for somebody to do occasional preaching around here? I just got ordained. And... Uh, they said, yeah, there's a church out in Southborough, First Community Church, and they're looking for an interim. And they passed on my name, and the church called me, and I got to be their uh, interim pastor. And by January of 72, the, <laughs> the old deacon came in and said, well, we've been interviewing candidates, and we've decided we can't do any worse than you. Uh, and uh, this is the humility, Mia. We can't do any worse than you, so would you be our pastor? <laughs> and we moved to the parsonage next door. Candace taught in Southboro, taught junior high, uh, which if you teach seventh grade for just three years, you automatically go to heaven. And, and um, I pastored that church and worked on the degree. And that church changed me, transformed me into... Uh, a person I had not been before. And uh, they, uh, the, the church was organized in 1865, uh, the same year, uh, the same month as the uh, 13th Amendment. Mm. And I went back to celebrate their 150th with them. And so that's the quick story of that. Thank you and, and bless you for inviting me today <laughs> to say it out loud with you. We have um, a few quick moments for quick questions. I will come and bring the mic to you. Please keep it under 30 seconds so we can let Dr. Leonard drive back to Winston-Salem. Happy Father's Day. That's number one. I have to say that. You are such an awesome man and child of God. You're a man and a child. But I just wanted to ask the question 
because I'm cel I've been celebrating Juneteenth the whole weekend. I'm from Philadelphia. I never heard of Juneteenth in my life until I moved to Charlotte, North Carolina. So I feel that sometimes we're in a place that we're supposed to be, <clears throat> to learn so much and then to become a part of it. Okay. What I wanted to ask, because most people refuse to accept the fact that Egypt is in North Africa. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is something that's been on my mind for a long time. <clears throat> they don't want to accept that fact, but that's where the slaves were. Okay, it's number two. Slaves were Jews. The Jews were slaves in Africa. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Who were those slaves? And why was it that the mother and father of Jesus had to hide mm -hmm. because they were Jews to save their two-year-old child from death mm -hmm. through King Herod? Mm -hmm. Well, question. How do you explain to most people about how Christ describes himself in Revelations 1.14? where he says his hair is like wool and his skin is like burnt bronze. Oh, I'm sorry, one more thing. My father was a black Jew from Ethiopia and they were called falashas. I just oh wanted to goodness. share, because oh you're such goodness. an awesome man. You're oh so awesome, goodness. thank God Amazing. for you. Um, the images, well, two or three things. And you made me think of this. It may not fit what you're asking, but I always wanted to do a study of the, the biblical texts that Jerry Falwell used consistently in contrast with the biblical texts that Martin Luther King Jr. used consistently. And, and, and I never did get to, but I, I've gotten some little hints, and that is that the, that's why the exodus and the delivery from uh, slavery was so important to African Americans. And, and uh, that's why even Jesus' own um, uh, exile in Egypt, quote unquote, was another reminder uh, of the dangers uh, of, of trying to escape and, and was also, I think, a, a reminder for folks from, on the Underground Railroad, a text that was not uncommon to be referenced there. Uh, and um, and someone asked about uh, Jesus and slavery. That's the other thing that I've thought about uh, the, the MLK and the Jerry Falwell uh, text that, that, um, that Paul is a favorite of Falwell and the Gospels are a favorite of uh, Martin Luther King. So, and, and I, I have to tell you, I don't, I don't know, I'm not exegete enough to say anything about Revelation at all, let alone Jesus in Revelation. But, but um, uh, I think that, I think the, the main point for me there would be that, that, that the exalted Christ encompasses all of this. Thank you. I'm going to switch, come around to Ed really quickly, and then we'll take a last question there. With Bill, yesterday we, uh, we drove back from a wedding on Friday night in Charlottesville, Virginia, and we, we went past <clears throat> Popular Forest, I think it's called, which is Jefferson's second home. Um, and, and from where we were in Charlottesville, you could look up at the mount where Monticello was. And I couldn't help but think about what had recently happened in Charlottesville. We, we went past Liberty University on the way up there and wow. coming back. And um, with Jefferson and Sally Hemings, you, you, what you said about Paul earlier, I think in some ways could apply to Jefferson. He was a, he was a captive of his time. Sally Hemings, likewise, was a captive of her time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But apparently, from what I read, he fathered by Sally Hemings maybe five children over mm -hmm. an extended period of time. Mm -hmm. um, 
and, and as we teach our history, <laughs> that's something I didn't learn about when I was learning my history along mm -hmm. the way. Um, <clears throat> but, but as we deal with something like that and, and all this being written about it now, um, how do we teach young people without having, without committing what we call microaggressions or unfairly upsetting them and so forth, but how do we acknowledge that truth and, and what is the truth about it? I mean, what, what went on between those two people besides the obvious sex that went on between them? Uh, you, when I finish the dissertation that you ask, I'll read that. <laughs> it's a great question. Two or three things. And this goes back to, to uh, the, the issue Mia raised a, a moment ago about uh, what I was calling repentance and um, uh, engagement. And that is, and, and I'll give you a quick illustration, and I don't know if it works with you all or not, but, but it's worth thinking about. I don't know if it's going to work for Wake Forest. Wake Forest, uh, particularly with the guidance of the Dean of the Divinity School, uh, Dr. Uh, Jonathan Walton, uh, and, and the new director of uh, African American Studies, Dr. Corey Walker, um, uh, they, they did this as, as, a, as a trial. And that is to keep the name of, Waite, of Samuel Waite on the chapel but to remove Wingate's name from the building that attaches to the chapel. Which, uh, and and they, they came up with another name, and it, you've probably read about it. A lot of African-American alums pushed back. That's another question. But what, what I thought was, a, you, 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 you can't remove everybody's name, but you can, but, and you, it's not cancel culture, it's owning the past. And so <clears throat> you take one you take one uh, name and replace it uh, that seems somewhat more blatant, hence the, the names I cited today and, and in church. Uh, but you leave others, and that reminds you of both. So you have to tell Sally Hemings' story and tell it loudly and extensively and write it into all the texts. But you don't write Jefferson out. Uh, because we've all got those sides to us. Uh, we're all earthen vessels, St. Paul. And, and, but we're at a place in our culture where, where it's so raw and it's so broken and it's gone on so long that, that negotiating that tension uh, is where we are. And, and so the division remains, and, and you hope there will be people that will be able across the theological, political, uh, racial spectrum that will, that will work to find ways uh, to do that. And, and there, are, there are little pieces, but right now it's just fragmented as can be. And, and, but, but finding ways that where you, you keep the reminder of where we've been, but you soften and, and go beyond that reminder with where we should have been and ought to be now. And, and that's hard to do, but, but I've, been, I've been really interested. I've done some work with Baylor on this and Furman and Wake Forest uh, as a historian of, of this, particularly because those were all Baptist schools uh, and that's what I got asked to talk about that. And I'm just very, I'm very, I'll use the word proud of those schools for the way they've tried to go about it. Uh, and, and I say this as a Texan, the rest of you can't say it, even Baylor is doing that. And that's a major thing. And they've had serious pushback as, you, as you'd expect. Uh, I think the, pres the pastor of First Baptist Church uh, Dallas told them that when they officially recognized the LGBTQ group on campus that Baylor had gone infidel. That's his wonderful 19th century word uh, applied to a 21st century school. But I'm, I'm encouraged, uh, Georgetown, UVA, uh, Virginia 
theological seminary Episcopal has started moving toward concrete reparations as just their witness. They're not saying everybody ought to do it. They're saying this is our witness. And, and so I'll finish up by saying, I think we all have to think about our witness in this as churches, as individuals, as uh, educational institutions. Uh, and, and where can we give our witness and then work hard to listen to the people who've been on the front lines all along and find ways to be with, for, among them in it? Thank you for that. We have one final question, and then uh, we'll hear what you have to say. Y'all are going to be late getting to... Uh, <laughs> Somewhere. Uh -huh. Well, if you, if you'd have to do like postdoc work on my question. What can Myers Park Baptist learn from Evolution Church, and why have they been able to go past that 50% drop? They're in that fundamentalist group of Southern Baptist <laughs> Church, and they've done, they seem to be growing faster than any church in America, or at least that I know Did of. Did you say elevation? Yeah, elevation. Yeah. That's a great question, uh, and, and here, here's my social historian thing. That's where they are now. Uh, ask me, and, and they may continue to grow. God bless them if they do. But the, but the culture is so fluid. Part of what churches like that know is that they have to they have to continue to do what they're doing with a younger generation because there are people among them who come of age and don't stay. I, I, have, I had a former student who went to a, a workshop at Andy Stanley's church in Atlanta, mm -hmm. um, Buckhead and the like, and this was several, this was a couple of years ago, and they had already begun to change their approach because they said, the things we used to do with one set of Gen Xers, we can't do anymore and get the attention of the millennials. And they had begun, shh, don't tell anybody, they had begun to allow uh, LGBTQ people who were participants in the church to be ushers. They wouldn't let them teach Sunday school, but they had let them be ushers and do other things, and particularly even uh, couples. Now, I don't know if you felt uh, a tremor in the force when they did that, <laughs> but there was one. And part of, what those, part of what those churches are trying to do, and uh, J.D. Greer is an illustration of this, I, I think he'll stay in the SBC for maybe two more years. But uh, sooner or later, if they're going to continue to keep the attention of a younger generation, they're going to have to moderate the harshness of some of those views that that particular denomination or evangelical subgroup uh, requires of them. Because nobody's going to come to that. Mm -hmm. uh, nobody's going to do that. And, and they're going to say, you talk about Jesus and all this, and then you treat... X, Y, and Z types of people this way. N not that Jesus. We're not doing it. So I think they, ha they have met a challenge and they have a lot of energy, but, but, but they're also discovering that the kind of, you know, laser worship and uh, contempt stuff and all that, that that works sometimes, but doesn't work all the time. Mm -hmm. And they've got, to, they've got to now do targeted worship and targeted focus uh, for what they're doing. But by the way, and I may be wrong about them. I may be wrong about them. But the, the, one of the things that's been the hardest, as I've seen as an educator, the loss of consistent Sunday school attendance has killed biblical knowledge in the, in the South. Uh, it, it has. Uh, and the, the Sunday school told us what the Bible said. It didn't do a great job at telling us what the Bible meant always. At least my Sunday school teachers, who were wonderful people, didn't. But, but I knew what the Bible meant. And I get seminarians who tell me, I taught this past two semesters, you use the Bible in ways you think we know about, 
and you're going to have to tell us. You can't just throw out these terms because we didn't grow up going to Sunday school. And that's where, that's where these mega churches may have a benefit, but I'm not so sure. Mm -hmm. I'm not so sure. So it, it, yes, they are growing, but, but the, the whole religious society is so fluid, they've got to keep adapting. Mm -hmm. and, and some of them have, some of those earlier megachurches, uh, Robert Schuler's, gone. Right, right. And that's what they have to know. You can run your course. Right. Great question. Thank you. That's an excellent question. We can talk another hour for that, but I won't do that. After all this today, uh, if you want to, you can write to Wake Forest Divinity School and get three hours credit. I've told you all this before, but since it's Wake Forest, it'll cost you $10,000 each. Dr. Leonard, thank you so much for sharing two weeks in a row with us. Thanks, Mia. I'm so grateful um, for your leadership and your care. And I'll thank you all for staying. And please continue to ask questions. And as the Minister for Faith Formation, do come to Bible study. Amen. <laughs>